Let's start the recording. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the workshop, Building Your Broader Impacts Plan. It's our intention to help you uh, create a rough draft of a broader impacts plan for your next NSF proposal. My name is Miles McNall. I am from the Office of University Outreach and Engagement, and joining me today as co-presenter is Sarah Steenrod from the Office for Research and Innovation, and Angie Kankala, also for the Office of Research and Innovation, is going to be monitoring the chat and fielding your questions. So if you have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. As I've already said, um, <clears throat> we sent you early this morning uh, a worksheet and a resource sheet. Please make sure that you go and find that worksheet right now and have it open and ready to use because that's how we're gonna um, help you build your broader impacts plan today. So before we get started, a word about our dear departed colleague, Shobha Ramanand. Uh, Shobha Ramanand um, used to work in the office of um, research and innovation. And she served as a mentor to me when I first um, got into the broader impacts field and, and started working with faculty around their broader impacts plan. And Shoba, because she had been at the institution for, a lot, for such a long time, really understood um, all of the rich array of resources available at MSU to help support faculty and, and kinds of broader impacts act activities that faculty had succeeded with. And she helped um, with an earlier draft of this workshop. So I just wanted to stop and, and acknowledge Shoba for a moment. Um, so after today's workshop, uh, you should be able to explain or, or describe the following things to a colleague. First of all, what is NSF's broader impacts criterion? Um, what are key research impact areas that you should be aiming for? Where do broader impacts belong in your proposal? What are the six key elements of a BI plan? And then where do you go for resources and supports to help build your BI plan? Both resources on campus, as well as um, some really nice online resources that we're gonna talk about later. And with that, I hand it off to Sarah. Thanks, Miles. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so we're gonna start off with the basics and we're gonna start by addressing these, these following questions. So what are broader impacts and why are they important? So today we're gonna be um, using the framework and speaking the language of the National Science Foundation and the National Alliance for Broader Impacts or NAVI. However, many of the general points that we're gonna make today are gonna be applicable to a wide range of funding agencies. Um, next slide, please. Now. Okay, so the NSF uses two criteria to evaluate essentially all proposals it receives. The first is intellectual merit, and that's defined as the potential for the proposed activity to advance knowledge and understanding within its own field or across different fields. And so you can kind of think of this as a shorthand for the um, scientific impact. The second criteria is the broader impact or the potential for the proposed activity to benefit society or advance desired societal outcomes. Next slide, please. So these broader impacts can be achieved primarily in three ways. Um, first, they can be achieved through the research itself. So depending on your research topic, achieving your research objectives may actually have a direct benefit to society. Um, second, it can be achieved through activities directly related to specific activities in your research plan. And so that could be um, including um, increased representation of students and postdocs from traditionally marginalized or underrepresented groups in your lab. Um, third, broader impacts can be achieved through activities that are complementary to a research projects. So this is developing interactive activities that teach public audiences fundamental concepts from your research. Next slide, please. Okay. So to give you a more concrete idea of what NSF even means by broader impact, 
or uh, desired societal outcomes. Nabi identified nine impact areas. And so I'm just gonna go through these for you here. Um, the first is full participation of women, persons with disabilities and underrepresented minorities in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Improved STEM education and educator development at any level. Uh, the third is increased public scientific literacy and public engagement with science and technology. Next is improved well-being of individuals and society. Um, development of a diverse, globally competitive STEM workforce. Enhanced infrastructure for research and education. Increased partnerships between academia, industry, and others. Increased economic competitiveness of the United States and improved national security. So this is not to say that your broader impact activities must achieve all nine of these impacts. Rather, this is meant to show that the definition of broader impacts is itself quite broad. And there are many different types of activities that you can plan to achieve these positive impacts for society within this framework. Uh, next slide. So from a more practical perspective, this quote captures the importance of crafting a strong, broader impact section. While a great broader impact statement won't float a proposal with poor science, a poor broader impact statement can sink a proposal with good science. So to make sure that your proposal is maximally competitive, it's essential to give consideration to the broader impact section. Next slide, please. So your broader impacts are gonna appear in many key sections in your proposal. So in addition to the dedicated label set, labeled sections that are required by NSF in your project summary and your project description, your broader impacts are gonna be interwoven throughout your grant proposal. It can appear, can appear in special information and supplementary documentation, uh, the postdoc mentoring plan, the data management plan, the letters of collaboration, your bio sketch, and of course, the budget and justification. Next slide, please. So one approach for writing a really strong broader impact section is to treat your broader impact activity as you would a key experiment in your research plan. So first you need to identify a goal. What is it that you want to achieve? Next, describe how you'll do it. What methods will you use to achieve this goal? For example, what are the specific activities that you have planned? Um, as you would for a key experiment, you wanna convince your reader that the activities you're proposing are feasible. So explain to them why these activities are likely to succeed. So consider this like your preliminary data. For example, have you done something similar in the past? Are you leveraging an already existing successful program? And finally, you need to describe how you will know you are successful. So how will you evaluate whether or not you've achieved your goal? By thinking of your broader impact plan as you would with the scientific aims, it ensures that you're gonna include the right level of detail in your description of your activities. Next slide, please. The broader impact plans that contain, can, contain careful details will make a really good impression on reviewers. So these are two examples um, pulled from actual summary statements from funded NSF proposals. Um, so I'll read them quickly to you. The first says that plans for these activities are well described, including details not only on content, but also strategies that will ensure effective messaging and wide dissemination. Outreach to activities also include plans for assessment and build on existing infrastructure and previous efforts. BI also includes integrative training at multiple levels, including specific mechanisms so to recruit thing. undergraduate students from ethnic and racial minority groups and to broaden participation in STEM. And then the second reads, outreach with the children's garden is very de well detailed, including target elementary audience, and specific roles and activities. Of note, the plans will be integrated with existing programs, address next generation science standards, and include detailed measures of success. No weaknesses noted. So this is the goal, is to write a broader impact statement that contains all of the right information to elicit this kind of reviewer enthusiasm. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, on the flip side, um, these, this is in contrast to the reviewer uh, raves, these are the criticisms that are, again, pulled from actual summary statements from unfunded proposals. Um, and although these are specific examples, they're actually highly representative of the most common complaints from re reviewers. So this is what to avoid. 
Um, so the broader impacts are generic. They need to be connected with the proposed research and describe the impact of the proposed research. The proposal will support one graduate student, but their role is not clearly defined. There's no discussion of metrics for measuring the success of the graduate students throughout the proposal. Um, the proposal should provide more details on how it plans to recruit underrepresented and minority students as well as sufficient evidence of activities in the past. And the worst is these broader impacts are routine. So to avoid getting feedback like this, we're gonna move on now to talk about the characteristics of a great BI plan. Next slide, thanks. Okay, first, the broader impacts need to be meaningfully connected to your research. They should be developed concurrently and integrated into the research plan. And those broader impacts should grow naturally from your research. Next, your broader impacts should be innovative and creative. So this isn't to say that you need to reinvent the wheel when you're developing these activities, but they should be as innovative and creative as your research. Um, as we saw from the reviewer critique slide, reviewers are not enthusiastic about BI plans that are predictable or canned or feel tacked on. Next slide, please. The BI plan should be realistic and feasible. Um, however, keep in mind, it should not be so ambitious that it actually interferes with your research plan. Rather, the envisioned impacts should be realistic and relevant to the funding agency. They should be solidly grounded in literature and they should include preliminary data support to support the feasibility of the BI. Um, next slide, please. So returning to the idea that you should treat your BI as you would treat your science, just as reviewers will examine your proposal to determine if your research team has the skills and expertise necessary to do the proposed work, so will they evaluate the extent to which your BI team or you yourself um, has the experience, skills, and resources to carry out the proposed BI activities. So be sure to describe the prior experience of the team. Be sure to have identified your partners and check that your budget reflects the scope and the scale of the BI plan. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, a great BI section will contain a well-developed plan to evaluate and disseminate your broader impact. Uh, next slide. Okay, so next we're gonna take a closer look at a couple of really strong broader impact activity examples and discuss what impacts they might achieve. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this BI activity leverages Google Earth Stories to teach macro systems ecology. So the program involves enabling the public to tour field sites using Google Earth and teach them about the connection between plants and global change. So this PI has a partnership with the MSU Hub staff to ensure learning materials meet next generation standards and they're gonna work with Google Earth to develop classroom materials. To disseminate these materials, the PI will work with the National Ecological Observatory Network or NEON an NSF funded project with broad reach. Um, so maybe in the chat, we can discuss um, what are some of the broader impacts of this activity? Can you see how they align with NSF's goals? Yeah, they may be not so easy to recall immediately, but I would, I would say that, um, these, these, this activity fits into a couple of different uh, buckets for NSF. So um, you could argue that it meets, there's the impact of enhanced infrastructure for research and education, um, improved STEM education educator development at any level, increased public scientific literacy and public engagement with science and technology, and maybe, and maybe others as well. Okay, uh, next slide. So the next activity is the Research Experience for Teachers, the RAT program. Um, that includes a six-week institute for middle and high school teachers to enable them to participate in cutting-edge re cutting research in MSU labs. And the program includes one-on-one -on -one mentoring with a goal of developing innovative curriculum modules to bring back to the classroom. And here you can see we've identified some of the broader impacts of this activity. So it's broadened participation, um, improved STEM education and educator development at any level, and development of diverse globally competitive STEM workforce. Uh, next slide. And another really excellent example of a broader impact activity that leverages an existing successful program is participation in the MSU Science Festival. So this is a really wonderful opportunity at MSU. It's really easy to get involved in. It has a huge reach. And all you need is a compelling presentation or a hands-on activity. 
Uh, if you haven't already, consider getting involved for next year. Um, in addition, the website has lots of great tips for engaging the public with your science. So now I'm gonna hand the presentation over to Miles, who will talk about the core elements of a broader impact plan. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sarah. So the rest of this workshop is gonna be organized around the six core elements of a sound broader impacts plan. Uh, goals, participants, partners in settings, activities, budget, and evaluation. Uh, and as I said before, make sure you have your worksheets handy because we're gonna start working on uh, each of these different sections as we go. So I like to start with goals in mind first. I like to think about um, what are the goals, what are the impacts we're trying to achieve, and then think about what are the activities, partners, the audiences that will allow us to achieve those goals. And <clears throat> Sarah ref uh, referred, um, reviewed these with you earlier. We're not gonna do that again. But what we're instead going to do is to uh, highlight one of these and then get a sense from you of what goal areas you're thinking about within the broader impacts domain. So I wanna highlight broadening participation because it's one that is uh, very common. Uh, nearly all of the uh, broader impacts plans that I have personally helped faculty work on have included this element. And NSF takes it very seriously and it addresses a very concerning problem. And that problem is that uh, non-dominant populations in the US, as you know, have been significantly underrepresented in STEM education, in the STEM professions, and in civic decision-making about science, technology, engineering, and math. However, when designing your own broader impacts activity, it's important to keep some considerations in mind. It is not enough to simply increase access for underrepresented groups to existing STEM opportunities. And that's because STEM opportunities designed for dominant culture groups may not always be appropriate or work for members of underrepresented groups. That's why I'm going to emphasize the partnership role here work with community partners, people who are connected to underrepresented groups you hope to involve in your broader impacts activity and co-create um, broader impact activities with them that are culturally responsive. Fortunately, at MSU, we have a wealth of MSU partners uh, to help you with your broadening participation goals. This is a small list. I actually have a much longer list that I can share with you and we'll share with you when we send you the slides after today's session. But we have uh, people in the, in the graduate school. So there's a lot, of, a lot of broadening participation activity happening with graduate students, including the AGAP program, SRAP and CAFE, the College of Engineering, as a diversity programs office that runs the Michigan Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, the GEM Fellowship, the list goes on and on. So in nearly every college, you can find people whose role it is to actually help you work with underrepresented groups. So we want to launch a poll here and we want to find out, you know, what kinds of BI goals are you focusing on? So what we want you to do is to um, fill out this poll and select the different impact areas you think are going to be priorities for you. Okay, we'll wait until we get Oh, about 70% at least participation in the poll.
All right, just a few more seconds. We're at 76, 80%, 83. And it looks like we're stopping there. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll in just a second. All right, and let me share the results with you. So let's take a look and see what we have. Um, <clears throat> as, I, as I expected, and this, this happens consistently every time we do this workshop, um, number one is, is broadening participation um, or the longer version, full participation of women, persons with disabilities and underrepresented minorities in science. Followed by, and we have a three-way tie then um, between improved STEM education and educator development, increased public scientific literacy and public engagement with science and technology, and then improved well-being of individuals and society. And then we have a two-way tie for third place, development of a diverse globally competitive STEM workforce and increased partnerships between academia, industry, and others. Nobody chose improved national security. That's not unusual. I've never seen anybody select that one before, but that is a legitimate broader impacts activity. So let me stop share. And let's move on to the six elements. Okay, so uh, for those of you who attended the uh, Impact Identity Workshop, this is going to be a bit of a review. Uh, for the rest of you, um, the reason I'm talking about this concept of, of impact identity is that there's some good scholarship out there that suggests that researchers maximize their ability to achieve broader impacts when they do four things. First is to clearly articulate what is called your impact identity. Second, define what your specific impact goals are. Third, develop a long-term plan to achieve them. And fourth, have the necessary supports and resources to carry out those activities. And one of the things I wanna make clear about this is when we talk about impact goals and a long-term plan, we're not talking necessarily about what you're going to do in your next proposal. That's a step along the way, but that's not the whole story. When we talk about impact identity, we're actually talking about something much broader than that and longer term than that. We're talking about something that evolves throughout your career. So to provide you with a formal definition of what impact identity is, it's something that results from a thoughtful and intentional integration of a scientist's multidimensional self-concept. So really you're bringing all of yourself into this, not just your identity as a researcher necessarily. It blends the researcher, someone who aims at contributing knowledge within a scientific discipline with the engaged scholar or someone who ensures results of their research benefit society. The scholar's impact identity is located at the intersection of the driving questions of their discipline, the questions that drive their own scholarship, and urgent societal needs. That's where your impact identity is. So let me give you an example. And I'm going to talk about um, one of my favorite scientists, Dr. Suzanne Simard. Dr. Samard is a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia and the author of the best-selling book, Finding the Mother Tree. If you love trees, I, I urge you to get this book. It's a wonderful book. In her book, she traces how her initial curiosity about how trees interact in forests turned into a highly productive scholarly career in which she and other researchers really transformed our understanding of how trees share resources in forests through underground fungal networks. So Dr. Samard's discipline is forestry. Her research focuses on research exchange, resource exchange among trees 
through mycorrhizal networks and how this contributes to the resilience of forests to climate change and the societal needs that her research addresses include forest resilience to climate change, carbon sequestration, and habitat preservation. And her impact identity lies at the intersection of these three domains. Her impact identity is how her research within the discipline of forest ecology on resource exchange between trees through mycorrhizal networks contributes to forest resilience to climate change, increases carbon sequestration in trees and soil, and preserves the habitats of wild species. So let's spend a few minutes exploring your impact identity. So we have um, an activity here that's gonna last about 20 minutes. So the first part of it, you're gonna spend about uh, 10 minutes addressing the following questions. You're gonna write a three sentence research impact statement that addresses these questions. What questions drive my research? What societal needs does, I, does my research address? And what societal impacts do I hope to achieve through my research or related activities? Then we're gonna put you into breakout rooms so 10 minutes working on your own, and then another 10 minutes in breakout rooms, and you're essentially going to pitch these impact statements to each other and receive back feedback from your colleagues. And before I do that, before we, we send you off to your independent work, um, I'm gonna provide you with an example. Um, so let's say I was um, Dr. Samard, and maybe she's done this, I don't know, but I created uh, a research impact example uh, based on her work. She might say, I am a forest ecologist who studies the exchange of resources between trees through mycorrhizal networks. You know, so that's, that's um, her research. My research addresses a critical need to understand how these exchange networks contribute to the resilience of boreal forests to climate change, right? So that's the societal need that she's addressing. We need our forests to stay healthy. Um, and <clears throat> the third part then is what specific impacts she hopes to achieve through her research. So she, she writes, the intended impacts of my research are to transform our understanding of how forests operate, resulting in a shift in forestry practices away from clear cutting to the cultivation of forests with a diverse mix of species that are more resistant to climate stress, increase carbon sequestration and preserve wild habitats. Okay, so starting now, um, you're gonna, you'll have 10 minutes to work on your um, work, using your worksheets and address these first three questions, okay? It is back. Uh, I hope you learned some interesting things about your colleagues. Uh, my personal experience is I've never listened to an MSU faculty member talk about or a graduate student or postdoc talk about their work and didn't find it really interesting. So I, I'm, I hope you had an opportunity to, uh, to learn, learn about each other's work uh, and also um, support the development of a really strong, compelling uh, research impact statement. I think um, the reason I emphasize that so much as a starting point is that makes everything so much easier. Um, so are there any questions um, anybody has before we move on to the next um, element of a broader impacts plan? If you do, just feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and pose the question. Melvin. Miles, I think um, there is sort of a common thread in our group, and uh, this is you know, certainly an important question for me because I struggled a lot with this, which is to separate um, the impact, the needs from the impacts. I found myself repeating some of the same things when I was trying to describe the impact, uh, uh, the, the needs, societal needs that were being addressed versus societal impact. So if you can, uh, provide any guidance on that. Um, 
Can they be overlapping? Um, do they need to be entirely separate? I think you know, some of the discussions we had were about trying to connect the impacts to the list that was shared earlier um, in the presentation. Um, and we also you know, wondered you know, how far would we be stretching to try to connect, even if tangentially our work to those, those bullet points on that list versus if it doesn't really align well, do we just come up with our own way of describing impact? So I think there's probably two questions in there. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the last one. And I think that, that the list of, of the nine impact areas is, is very general and should capture a lot. Um, but it's not, it, it, your broader impacts are not limited to that. Um, and I would say that any broader impacts plan, however, should should probably address one or more of those, but it could be something else that isn't that isn't found within those. And um, and and with regard to being needs and impacts being awfully close to each other, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> the way I think about it is uh, if you if you use uh, Dr. Samard's example, the need is to mitigate climate change. The solution is, or the impact is to change forest management practices. So I would, I would think of the impact as a solution to a need, if that's, if that's helpful. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. Then we will move, move ahead. Uh, and please keep your keep yourself muted. I'm hearing some a little bit of background noise. So after um, thinking about um, your goal, one of the first things to consider is um, who are your participants? Um, and NSF very very often uses the word audience. What's who's your audience for broader impacts? I think um, my problem with audience is that is that it, it implies it's a really a passive role. And so I like to think about uh, who participants might be in your broader impact activities. In other words, who are you going to engage around your science? Um, and here, here are some common categories of, of broader impacts participants. So underrepresented populations, that's very common as part of the broadening participation goal, K-12 students and teachers, Lifelong learners, so adults who are, who are continuing to learn about science uh, throughout their life, members of the general public, hobbyists, um, you know, pe like people who are, who are bird watchers. Um, that's, that's a natural target for someone who, who uh, studies birds. Um, citizen scientists, um, you know, involving citizens in the collection of scientific data for your projects. Uh, industry is often a common target um, for participation. And then government and policymakers, if your goal is to try to shift uh, policy in some, in some area. And when you're thinking about your participants and writing uh, your BI plan, it's, it's really important to be very specific about who your participants are. Um, so talk about the demographics, talk about where ages, gender, race, ethnicity, income, anything else about, about that group from a demographic perspective that's important, and identify if they are, in fact, um, underrepresented in STEM. Tell how many. How many people are going to be involved? That has implications for your budget and for the feasibility of the activity. Uh, explain why. What's your rationale for working with this group? Why is it important to work with this particular audience? You have to have a reason. Um, recruitment, how are you going to reach them? Uh, do you have a mechanism to do that? Do you need a partner, uh, someone who has experience working with that population? Um, do you need a partner to, to reach your audience or population? And then how will they benefit? You have, you have to articulate how, how your participants are gonna benefit from, that, from this activity and how you're gonna know. And the how you're gonna know part goes to your evaluation plan. Um, so one of the things to think about when thinking about your uh, participants or your audience is, you know, how comfortable or competent do you feel in working with them? Do you have experience working with these different groups listed here? And 
if you don't have experience, you know, that's okay. This may be an aspiration for you. You've always wanted to work with this particular group of people, but you don't know how, you don't know where to get started. Well, there are lots of places to get started on campus. So you can come to my office, University Outreach and Engagement. That's sort of what we do is, is connect faculty and students with, with external audiences and partners. K-12 outreach. So, you know, because, because um, K-12 audiences are so common for BI activities, um, you should be talking to the Office of K-12 Outreach in the College of Education. MSU Extension can, can connect you with populations throughout the state. Uh, MSU Innovation Center is an excellent resource, resource for connecting uh, faculty, postdocs, graduate students to industry. Uh, and IPSER, or the Institute for Public Policy and Social Research, um, provides many supports in, in working with policymakers to influence social policy. And then last, and certainly but not least, reach out to faculty, staff, or students you know about uh, who have prior experience with working with your participants or population. And we have lots and lots of engaged faculty on our campus with uh, deep experience in working with different groups. And I'm sure they would be happy to advise you. So that brings us to uh, a quick activity. Um, I'm actually gonna try to keep us on schedule, limit this to five minutes. This is an on your own activity. Um, we'd like you to just uh, take a few moments and jot down some quick ideas about possible audiences. So given the kinds of impacts that you were just talking about with your colleagues. Who does it make sense for you to be reaching out to? Who does it make sense for you to be engaging in your science? So try to answer these, these three questions in five minutes. Who are possible participants for my BA activities? Why is it important <clears throat> for me to work with them to achieve my desired impacts? And how will they benefit, okay? So it is, let's call it uh, 11 o'clock. So we'll say at 11.05, uh, we'll get started again. And in the meantime, you'll be working on your own uh, to answer these three questions using your worksheet. And are there any questions? And if you have any questions about this activity, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll respond in the chat. In the chat. Okay. So next we're going to talk about partners and settings. So that's, this is the third element of a BI plan. Who will you partner with to design and implement your BI activities? So I think um, one of the reasons I, it's important to think about partners is it, it takes some of the pressure off of you um, in designing an innovative BI activity because it, it is my belief and it's, it's been my observation over the time that the best BI plans come not um, fully born and dressed from the mind of a researcher sitting in an office by themselves thinking it up, but in the creative interplay between um, researchers and people who have experience working with target populations um, and, and understand um, how to work effectively with those groups. And also um, 
the partnership could include uh, members of the target group themselves. I think that's where real creativity uh, comes in. So as I said, it, it takes some of the pressure off of you uh, for thinking that you have to um, dream up the BI activity all on your own. And here are some good questions from the Broader Impacts Wizard, which I'll talk about a little later. Uh, key questions to ask yourself about uh, who your potential partners for broader impact activities are. So think about why they're, they're appropriate for the particular activity you're thinking about or the audience or population you're trying to reach. What do they bring to the table? What kinds of experience do they have? Do they have access to and experience working with particular populations? Um, do they control certain settings that are conducive for interacting uh, with your target audience? Uh, what resources do they bring to the table? And then think about how are you going to work together to achieve your goals and objectives? And ideally, these are goals and objectives that you co-create. Um, how are you going to define your roles? You know, sometimes your BI partners can be uh, in your proposal as co-investigators, key personnel. How are they going to be represented uh, in your budget? And think about what each side, what kinds of commitments each side is making to this partnership. What, what commitments are you as a researcher making for yourself and your institution? And what kinds of commitments uh, are your partners making and will you have a formal agreement, something like an MOU or, or a memorandum of understanding that spells out those different roles? I think actually having an MOU like that as a, a part of your proposal would count in your favor because it, it shows that there's actually a, a clearly articulated partnership and how it's going to operate. There's a plan in place. So, <clears throat> There are many ways to find uh, potential partners for your broader impact activities. Here's a, another incomplete list because there are so many, I couldn't fit them all on one page. So you have a lot of offices on campus this, that support engagement uh, and can help you find partners. My office, University Outreach and Engagement, the Center for Community Engaged Learning does a lot of work around um, creating partnerships for community engaged learning. There's the director of youth programs. There's our gifted and talented education program. MSU's Detroit Center for Populations in Detroit. MSU Extension can connect you throughout the state. Office of K-12 Outreach can uh, connect you to K-12 outreach audiences. Undergraduate research, college access initiatives. There's just a wealth of, of potential partners uh, on campus to help you with this. And all of the ones I've, I've listed here um, have said, yes, they're interested in, in helping um, faculty with their broader impacts work. We also have research um, centers that can connect you with, with particular populations, such as the Create for STEM Institute for K-12 Education, the Julian Samora Research Institute for Latinx Populations, the Native American Institute, and then on the right side, you see all these design spaces or settings where engagement can occur, such as the planetarium, the museum, the science festival, et cetera, et cetera, and also science media through, through WKAR, um, which does a lot of lovely work featuring um, the work of, of um, our researchers and communicating their research to public audiences, which is an important form of broader impact. Um, you can get help finding potential MSU partners by, go, by going to the University Outreach and Engagement Broader Impacts website. So if you simply type in Broader Impacts MSU into Google, this is, this is the first um, option that will come up. Um, if you just go to engage.msu.edu and click on ways to engage, the last option on that drop down menu is Broader Impacts. Um, and you can see one of the choices when you get there is to connect with potential MSU partners. And there's a list uh, more extensive than the one I provided just now of, of all of the people who can help connect you to partners. Um, so take five minutes and think now, given you know, 
my goals, um, <clears throat> my potential audience or, or participants, what partners make sense? Who do I need to partner with uh, to do my BI activities? Why would be, they be the appropriate partners for the goals and participants I have in mind? And then how do I connect them? In other words, what's, what's my plan for reaching out to them in the next you know, week or two weeks? So it is 112 right now. That gives you until, I mean, not 112, 1112. It gives you till 1117. All right, then let's move on to the next stage. Okay, let's talk about settings a little bit. Um, so, and as you might expect, who your participants are, who your partners are going to be, and, and the settings for your BI activities are going to be closely linked. For example, if your intended participants are, say, middle school students, like these beautiful children here, your partners might be their teachers, and the setting might be their schools. You might also engage with them in a place like the MSU Museum. So one of the things that, um, one of the points I wanna make is that throughout a person's lifetime, and, and that's what this graph shows, less than a third of their science learning will occur in formal science education settings. Most of a person's science learning will occur in informal learning environments, such as museums, science centers, and things like that. And so informal science educations are one of the most common settings for broader impacts activities. And what this table shows you is that, you know, compare, compared to formal education settings, um, informal settings are quite varied. And there are three main categories, um, design spaces like museums, science centers, zoos, aquariums, environmental, centers, and on and on. And then there's also programmatic forms of informal science education, such as hobbyist groups, citizen science projects, library programs, making and tinkering groups, outdoor and garden programs, summer programs. And then finally, there's science media, radio, TV, internet, blogs, um, there are so many science-related blogs right now that I cannot possibly keep up, and, and they're all so good. It's, it's hard to know what to choose from. And one wonderful new resource at MSU helps you find um, those informal learning settings. Uh, so go to visit learn. Uh, .msu.edu, and it'll help sort um, different kinds of informal learning setting, settings by things like audiences. So it's a really handy tool for finding out what's on campus um, that, that can serve as a resource uh, for informal learning activities, should that be the kind of broader impact activity you choose. So one hugely popular informal education setting at MSU um, for K-12 audiences is MSU's extensive summer pre-college programming for youth, which I hope is coming back full force this summer. COVID um, made a mess of these plans for two years running. And, and here's just a, a few of the many, many examples. So uh, for Spartan youth programs, we have the Spartan Robotics Camp, the Mass Science Technology Leadership Camp, Physics of Atomic Nuclei, OsteoChamps, the ANR Institute for Multicultural Students. And you can find out about uh, Spartan Youth programs by going to spartanyouth.msu.edu and learning about all of their programs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, science, excuse me. Miles, we do have a question before we, we move on. Oh. And the question is, can partners and participants be overlapping? 
A absolutely, yes. But but Mevin, if you want to, if you if you have a specific example, it, I might be able to provide a more accurate answer. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, so thank, thanks for the quick response too. So, but but um, just to give an example, so I, in the work that I'm trying to write a grant for, um, it involves uh, a small farms. And then, so there's, you know, as stakeholders, there's farm owners, there's farm organizations, and there's farm workers. Um, the data that I will be collecting really involves the farm owners and the farm workers. But then in some ways, when we think, so, so as participants, it will certainly involve both of those parties. But when we think about partners, of course, to gain access to the farm workers, I would need to work with farm owners, right? Uh, farm owners mm -hmm. as well, right? So, so this is where I kind of um, struggle with separating the two for partners and participants. Yeah, I, I mean, conceivably, your partners can, can be your participants. So you could, you could go directly to the members of the target audience and work with them to design the activity. Okay, thank you. Um, so back to science media, um, you know, this is, this is one um, form of informal science education that has exploded. Um, you know, back when I was a younger person, um, you know, we were, we were more limited in what we had. Um, we had the Scientific American and we had some science oriented programming on television and a little bit on radio, but this is all just, just expanded enormously, um, <clears throat> especially online and through podcasts. Um, so, you know, science related podcasts include Radio Lab, Star Talk, Science Versus, and, and many, many others. Um, so, this is, you know, a, a form of um, engaged activity. For broader impacts that um, that you might want to consider as well. And uh, if science communication is going to be part of your broader impacts activity, again, many resources at MSU to help support you in this activity. Uh, AgBio Research has a science communication resources um, webpage. MSU Libraries has a science communication guide. Um, there is the student-led organization, MSU SciComm. Um, Dave Paulson from Environmental Jur Journalism is a great resource. University Communications has the University Communications Toolbox. And as I mentioned before, also WKAR is a great partner in helping um, scientists communicate about their research to members of the public. So what I want you to think about next for five minutes is quickly jot some ideas down about, um, given your goals and audiences, what are some potential settings um, for BI activities? Are they going to be informal or formal learning settings? Will they be virtual, in-person, or hybrid? Will they be synchronous or asynchronous? It is now uh, 11.25, so we'll give you until 11.30 to think about this. Settings. All right, so um, we're gonna engage in a democratic process here. Um, the next thing we have on the schedule is a 10 minute break for you. Um, so we have um, three options. We could take no break because you've been taking breaks uh, all along the way as needed. Um, we could take a 10 minute break or we could take uh, a five minute break um, <clears throat> because we um, only have one more activity left to do and we could push on through and finish. So in the chat, what I'd like you to do is pick one of the three options, no break, five minute break, 10 minute break. And the no breaks have it. Okay, so we'll just, um, we'll just press right on through to the end and finish early. 
works for me. Okay. So let's talk about activities. Um, given your goals, given your audiences, settings, and partners, what will you do together? So honestly, it's hard to say. Given the vast uh, universe of potential BI activities, we, we can't possibly list them all. We can only really give you some general advice about their characteristics and then point you to places to look for great examples. Um, NSF has explicitly said it does not want to be prescriptive about BI activities. It wants researchers to be creative. It, it wants researchers to come with BI, BI activities that are novel, that aren't routine, but that are connected in meaningful ways to your research. Um, the online BI wizard uh, is a great place to, to go uh, to look for broader impact um, activity examples. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Uh, you can also go to the um, University Outreach and, and Engagement Broader Impacts website to find a compendium of um, activity examples. Uh, but one point I want to stress is um, that whatever you decide to do, decide to do it uh, in partnership with your partners or, or potential audience members. Because again, I think that's, that's where the creativity or magic can really happen. So just some general tips is that your broader impact activities, as we said earlier, as Sarah said earlier, uh, need to be meaningfully connected to their research. Uh, they, they need to not feel ancillary or tacked on. Um, there should be some connection between the broader impact activity and the kind of research you're, you're conducting. They should be innovative. Um, as, the, as the phrase broader impact suggests, they should be impactful. And let me emphasize that they should be fun too. They should be fun for certainly for your participants or audience members, but also for you, because if you're not enjoying it, um, your, your audience and your partners are probably not going to enjoy it either. So some very common broader impact activities uh, are K-12 outreach. Um, so reaching out to K-12 audiences, and also bringing students uh, into your lab, uh, developing curricula, broadening participation. I see that in almost every uh, broadening impacts plan, um, excuse me, broader impacts plan, citizen science, science communication, STEM workforce development, or developing research infra in infrastructure. These are all uh, extremely common. And um, Elise Auerbach and her colleagues at the Center for Academic Innovation at the University of Michigan developed this really useful guide for different uh, domains of public engagement. Uh, each of one could be a different kind of broader impact activity. Uh, so you can see um, up in the left-hand corner, um, they list alternative, informal, and lifelong learning. So targeting lifelong learners as your audience. Applied practice and professional consulting can be a broader impact. Business and entrepreneurship can be a broader impact. Uh, doing capacity building for community programs can be a form of broader impact. Communications and media, community engaged learning, community engaged research, holdings and collections. Um, it's a very extensive list. Uh, this might be a useful guide for you to use um, to think about your particular kind of activity. Um, and then I should mention that these, these slides will be available to you uh, after today's session so that you'll have um, this particular slide to look at. So this is going to be your final activity, which has an individual, an individual and group component to it. So <clears throat> what we want you to do is spend about five minutes jotting down some ideas um, about your potential broader impacts activity. Um, so thinking about your, the goals that you've already um, established, the audiences you're going to reach out to, the settings you're likely to do your activity in, and the partners you're likely to engage, 
what are some innovative BI activities that you could do together? Um, and in, in some ways, walking through these um, different elements individually is artificial because um, the way it's likely to actually come together in your mind is, is sort of all at once. Um, so you think about a particular audience and a setting and a partner at the same time. So this is an opportunity to integrate um, uh, what we've um, worked on up until this point. Um, so do that for about five minutes, and then we're going to put you um, back into your breakout rooms, uh, and you're going to pitch your ideas to your colleagues and get some feedback about what they think about your broader impact activity. Is it, is it interesting? Is it innovative? Is it likely to be uh, impactful? So <clears throat> it's 11.37, so um, we'll, we'll give you until 11.42 to um, come up with some ideas for innovative broader impacts activities, and then uh, we'll move you into breakout rooms. Um, we are going to make a quick trip through the remaining slides and leave questions until the end. So I just want to remind you that if you're looking for examples of broader impacts activities, go to the University Outreach and Engagement Broader Impacts Resources website. Again, if you type in Broader Impacts MSU into a Google search engine, that will be your first choice. You can always go, you can also go to engage.msu.edu and click on Learn to Engage. And the last option in the drop, drop down menu is Broader Impacts. So <clears throat> let's talk about budgets. So number one point here is to make sure that you adequately fund your BI activities. So just as reviewers evaluate whether you have adequate funding to carry out your research activities, they'll be assessing whether you've adequately funded your BI activities. And a general rule of thumb is about 10% of direct costs. If you underfund your broader impacts activities, the reviewers may decide that you're not serious about them. So some key considerations for BI budgets, um, what resources um, are in place that you can leverage? What new resources will your institution or your partner contribute? Who will be involved and how? How much time will they devote and how much does their time cost? So we're gonna talk a little bit about evaluation, but if you really wanna dive in deep uh, into talking about evaluation, we invite you to um, attend the session on April 26th, um, which is all about evaluating your broader impacts. But essentially this question is how will you know if you would have achieved your intended impacts. So why do you need to evaluate broader impacts? Because each proposal submitted to the NSF must include a section about its intended broader impacts and a plan for assessing them. So some key evaluation questions to ask yourself in thinking about your evaluation plan was, was it successful? In other words, were key goals and objectives met? Was it valuable for your audience? And was it appropriate for them? And how did your audience change? So very often broader impacts activities have a goal of changing knowledge, attitudes, skills, and behaviors with respect to science. One great guide that has really stood the test of time is the 2010 User-Friendly Handbook for Project Evaluation. Just put that in your search engine and it'll pop up. You can also find it at, at informalscience.org. Informalscience.org has a wealth of evaluation resources relevant to broader impacts, so that's a great place to go. Or you can come to the workshop on the 26th. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you might need to enlist the services of an external evaluator who's independent from your project. 
Um, I'm connected to evaluators at MSU in Michigan and throughout the US, so I can sometimes help you with that, but I can't make a guarantee. It really depends on people's availability, but I'm always, I'm always willing to try. Um, and then I just want to um, point you to some great BI resources that are a supplement to today's workshop. Um, number one resources that I want to point people to is ARIS's Broader Impacts Toolkit. Uh, this is really a wonderful collection of resources. Um, and you can find this, what you see the URL uh, below, but, it, but a shorter uh, way to get there is researchinsociety.org. That's researchinsociety.org. Research in Society is one word. Um, so their toolkit includes guiding principles, which is um, uh, basically a description of what broader impacts are and what a broader impacts plan should contain. It was written for initially for um, reviewers of proposals so they would know how to evaluate the quality of a broader impacts plan. But as a, as a proposer, it's really handy to have the criteria of merit at hand when you're crafting your own BI plan. There's also a, a planning checklist, all of the things that should be included in your BI plan. There's a wizard that actually steps you through much as today's workshop did of the different elements of your BI plan and spits out a draft BI plan at the end. And then there's a BI project rubric that you can use to assess um, the potential of your proposed BI project. Um, so again, you can find um, the guiding principles here, and that is the first resource um, that people are, who are new to broader impacts, that's the first resource I guide them to, I bet Sarah does too. Um, there's the wizard. Again, there's our um, resource, uh, broader impacts resource site at uh, University Outreach and Engagement. Um, here are people on campus who can help you with your broader impacts plan. For some horrible reason, I left out um, research, Office of Research and Innovation, where Sarah and Angie work, which is a, an oversight on my part, and I apologize for. But your associate deans of research can help, your college research administrators can help, um, university outreach, outreach engagement can help. Um, I want to tell you about the upcoming workshops. So April 26th is the next one. You can sign up for it on the Outreach and Engagement website and engage.msu.edu. We're going to be covering partners for broader impacts at MSU on April 12th, evaluation on April 26th, and then achieving broader impacts through industry partnerships, commercialization, and entrepreneurship on May 17th. Again, you can sign up for those at that URL below. We want your feedback. Uh, you can give it two ways. You can point your camera at the um, uh, QR code on the screen, or when you exit from today's session, um, the survey should pop up in your browser. So do it either way. It's really important to us uh, for you to tell us how we did today and how we could do better. Um, and we take your feedback very seriously. And with that, we have just a minute for questions. I will stop share and open it up. Um, questions can be directed at, at me, Sarah, Angie, uh, and another expert in broader impacts who joined us, Lauren, if she's still there. All right, everyone, it's been pleasant, pleasant spending the morning with you. Um, we hope to hear from you soon, and I hope the rest of your day goes very well.